It's wonderful that so many people joined. I'm very happy about that. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Sephardi Heritage Projects and uh, Tom Tila and David Mendoza for giving me the opportunity to tell you something about this beautiful library. Some of you might know it. And as you can see or can imagine, it really is every librarian's dream. It is so beautiful. And preferably, I would like to, uh, to give this presentation in the library itself so that you could experience with all your five senses, well, maybe not the, the taste, but like Ton said, the smell is amazing, what Etzreim is about. Uh, and I have to say that digital presentations like this are really next level for me as usually the people who know me know that I would stand in the library with the books around me talking about the books and now um, I, I have a lot of distance to the books and also to you as a public but I hope that I can take you with me in the passion that I have uh, for the collection and also for its history. And today I would like to share with you some manuscripts and printed books that in my view uh, are, uh, reveal a very strong and cherished Iberian identity. And to understand how we can see that and what it means, let me first give you some background on the history of uh, Etzreim. Etzreim means tree of life and the library is 404 years old this year. It is the oldest active Jewish library in the world. From uh, 1675 on, it is housed in the historical complex of the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. And you can see on this slide that um, it is lit by candles, by candlelight, and there's no electricity or heating in the synagogue. I will come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, the first refugees from the Iberian Peninsula arrived in Amsterdam shortly before the year 1600. And here education was provided to close the gap of the many generations of new Christians who knew little about their own Jewish tradition. And this was when a school was built that already soon after its foundation impressed and moved many visitors, especially because of the excellent quality of the curriculum. It was founded in 1616, and the library at Zreim was part of the Talmud Torah school. Over time, the name at Zreim became synonym for both school Talmud Torah and the library. In 1637, a charity, it was called a brotherhood, also called at Zreim, was established with a purpose to provide financial support for students of the school who might not be able to finish the school for lack of funding. And so in the 17th century, Etzring was the name of the school, the library, and also the, this brotherhood, the charity. In uh, 1648, we find the first documentation of how exceptional the school Etzring was in the Jewish world by someone who traveled from Prague to Amsterdam, Jesaja Horwitz. In, uh, in the appendix to his book, Schneeluchot Habrit, um, the son of the author, he was called Shabtai Shefter Hurwitz, tells us that he was moved to tears by Etzreim. And I quote, There I saw little children studying the whole Torah and then the rest of the Bible. After that, the whole Mishnah, and only when they were older, and that means about 13 years old, they started to learn Talmud and the commentary of Rashi. Moved to tears, I asked myself, um, why we don't use this method in our country. Oh, if only the wise men in the whole world would commit to this method of teaching as fundamental principle of, for all Jewish congregations around the world. So this he said about the school at, and the library at Srim. As I mentioned before, in 1675, the Portuguese congregation moved to its current location. And this was the classroom of the school at Sreim from 1675 on until the Second World War. There was a connecting door to the library and on the wooden panels on the wall you can see the names of the members of the charity. All members were listed in registers but from 1728 on the names of these financial backers were also recorded on the wooden panels uh, on the wall and they include also members from the early days of the charity. 
After the war and to this day, the former classroom is used as the so-called winter synagogue. And I promised you to come back to the, uh, the fact that the, the big synagogue uh, doesn't have any electricity. The winter synagogue has heating and light. So the services in the winter usually are, uh, are taking place in, this, uh, in the winter synagogue. Uh, this is the library today. And you can already see, you can also see that in, in my background. I'm not sitting in the library, so if you see me drink a glass of water, don't worry. I, uh, I'm sitting at home and not in the library. I won't pour it uh, on the books. Uh, to understand the collection of the library, it is important to realize that the members of this community incorporated many Iberian traditions into their new surroundings. And in this sense, the collection is a very good reflection of the range of thought and ideas of this young community. It is more than just a collection of books. Uh, the library has two parts, the original school collection of the congregation and the private collection of David Montesinos, which he gave to Etzrem in 1889. And I have a picture of him here with his assistant, uh, Jacob de Silva Rosa, in the original part of the library. You can also see on this slide the uh, nightmare of every librarian, and that is the, uh, the stove there, the, the, the lighting with the fire. We don't have that anymore, as you can imagine. Uh, Montesinos was librarian of Etzrim for 50 years and was very much aware, and I'm happy that he was, of the historic importance of keeping the original collection on separate shelves and not mixing the books with his own collection. Because I'll go back to the situation now, the library nowadays. Uh, the fact that he was aware of the historic collection separate from his own collection gives us the unique opportunity to see the whole range of thoughts and ideas of the first Portuguese Jews that settled in Amsterdam, um, as we can still identify the original collection. It is a window into the history of the Portuguese congregation in the 17th and 18th century. And you might know the expression, show me your bookshelf and I tell you who you are, is very true for the collection. Because many questions can be answered by looking at the shelves uh, in the library. Who were the first members of the congregation? What were their interests? Did they feel a citizen of Amsterdam, Dutch, Sephardic, Jewish, cosmopolitan? Did they take pride in their heritage or did they look back in hatred? And how did they, for example, react to the false Messiah Shabtai Tzvi, who caused enormous turmoil in the Jewish world around the year 1666? How did they deal with conflicts or thought about other relig religions? And also, what did daily life look like? Which methods of preparing medicine were there? And what was the price of meat? So what do the books tell us about the young Sephardic community in Amsterdam? And how did the members of this community perceive themselves? All this, these questions and more are answers by looking uh, into the collection of Etz Chaim. And I was focused especially on the manuscripts and printed books written in Amsterdam. And I've chosen some texts that give us an insight into different aspects of the personal identity of the writer and also of his audience. The concept of identity is, of course, quite complex and has changed through times. And in this presentation, I will focus on the personal identity of the individual person or the group. Basically, the approach to identity is the answer to the question, who am I or who are we? Um, life in the 17th century as a member of the Portuguese congregation was very much centered around the religious community, the school of the congregation and the library at Zrayim. And as a result, the collection of Etzrim provides, as I said before, an excellent insight into the mind and daily life of these so-called new Jews. And even further than that, we gain a clear picture of the identity and it might come as no surprise that it is that it has a distinctive Iberian nature. In terms of culture, the newcomers had an Iberian heritage and this was very much cherished here in Amsterdam. Uh, this is visible in the choice of language, the writing style, the arts and the subjects that were written about. And I will start with the language and writing. 
Portuguese remained the spoken language until well into the beginning of the 19th century, and it was also the administrative language for matters of the congregation. Spanish was the literary language and Hebrew was meant for liturgical use. Um, knowledge of Hebrew could not be taken for granted. So the vernacular was also a tool to reach those who did not know Hebrew. Um, evidence of the lack of knowledge of Hebrew can still be found in the 18th century, but I have a very early example here from the year 1629 when the first printer of Hebrew in Amsterdam, Menasseh in Israel, was planning to print this book, the work of Josef del Medico about physics, metaphysics, astronomy, Kabbalah, and the book is called Sefer Elim. The members of the board of the congregation, the Parnassim, had to give permission for every book printed. And also in this case, but Menasseh had already started printing the work. As not every Parnas knew Hebrew, Joseph Salomon was summoned, summoned by the board to translate the whole work into Portuguese and read it aloud in order to enable the Parnasim to judge the work. Manasseh had to explain difficult passages of the text. And by the way, we know now that certain parts, especially with criticism of Kabbalah, were censored by the Parnasim and never printed. So this is for another presentation. And here I want to focus on the use of Portuguese and uh, Hebrew. It seems that Portuguese also served as the language from which Hebrew was taught. And this is evident in this next book. It's a Hebrew grammar by Menasseh ben Israel that he wrote when he was only 17 years old. As teachers adapted the trivium, the grammar, logic and rhetoric to traditional Jewish scholarship in the school Talmud Torah in Amsterdam, there was also a focus on learning Hebrew grammar, and this approach was modeled on the Jesuit schools from familiar from Spain and Portugal. Particular care was taken to translate texts into Spanish and Portuguese. So this is the grammar written by the famous Menasseh in Israel. Um, he was born on Madeira in 1604, and his family arrived in Amsterdam in 1613. In 1622, when Manasseh was only 18 years old, he became a rabbi of the congregation and a teacher of Talmud Torah. Uh, as I mentioned before, Manasseh was the first Jewish printer of Hebrew in Amsterdam. He had an enormous uh, impact on the Hebrew printing industry uh, uh, in the world, I have to say, especially in Amsterdam. So this is a copy of his grammar, copied by his pupil Solomon de Oliveira in 1647. And I also have to say that this text was never printed. So this is, uh, this is very special. I believe that only three um, manuscripts, three copies of this manuscripts are uh, somewhere in the world, two of them in Amsterdam. There was definitely a demand, still a demand for dictionaries in the 18th century. As we can see here, a Hebrew Portuguese Talmudic lexicon written in Amsterdam in 1755. And uh, another example of the use of Portuguese alongside Hebrew is this comment. No, it's ah, yeah, it's this commentary from the 17th century on the 13 Articles of Faith of Maimonides in Hebrew with Portuguese translation. When we take a look at writing Hebrew, the Amsterdam Sephardim often chose to use the pre-expulsion medieval Sephardic script for their manuscripts. It looked like this. We have many examples of this type in our collection, and it seems that especially when emotion was involved, this distinctive type of Hebrew writing was used. And what is very interesting uh, about this fact is that um, this is the pre-expulsion Hebrew script, but we're talking about writing in the 17th century. So it's, it's very interesting. The fact is very interesting that they they uh, came back to this, uh, they used, they decided to use this pre-expulsion Hebrew script. Um, I want to show you one of the most uh, interesting, I believe, uh, manuscripts that we have in the collection that is uh, written in this pre-expulsion uh, 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 Sephardic script. Um, this is a good example of the emotional collection connection with the pre-expulsion Hebrew. 
It's a letter from the Amsterdam congregation to chapter three. And who's chapter three? Chapter three claimed to be the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, and the congregation wrote the letter to support him. And we're talking about the year 1666 here. Uh, the congregation asked him, what, what should they do? Should they, would we come to them or should they come to him? And this is all written in this letter, all these questions. And this letter was definitely sent, but never uh, arrived, um, never reached Zvi, as it became clear that he obviously was not the Messiah. Um, very few traces of this episode are found in Ezraim, as there seems to be evidence that this unfortunate chapter was best forgotten. Uh, and also, you would say, why do we have the letter in the collection when they really try to erase all the, uh, the evidence of this chapter? This letter had long been lost and only came back into the collection in 1933, when a German bookseller offered it to Ezraim in 1933, because he felt that it belonged there. In my view, the fact that it came into the collection into the 20th century saved it from the 20th, 17th century effort to erase this part of history. Apart from the use of pre-expulsion Hebrew, it also gives another interesting piece of information. You can all read that in, in the letter, but I have to say it is very difficult to read, even for those who, uh, who can read Hebrew. Uh, it looks a little bit like Arabic, and some people say. Um, so what this letter also says, and I quote, is this letter is written in the name of all Israel and his servants among the Spanish exiles now living in Amsterdam. So interesting piece of information about uh, how the Amsterdam uh, Jewish congregation felt. Um, this is, and there's another one in these, the same pre-expulsion script uh, for Kabbalistic discourses. This is a late 17th century copy and a polemical treat, treat, treatise by Isaac Ben Jacob Sasportas against David Mendes da Silva on the value of private prayer. It was written in Amsterdam in uh, 1720. Also both written in the same pre-expulsion Hebrew script. Um, interestingly enough, when it comes to the pronunciation of Hebrew, we also have a short exposition in the collection uh, on the preference of Sephardic pronunciation uh, of Hebrew over the Ashkenazic. So that's also interesting. Uh, let me get to the arts. There had been a strong tra tradition of biblical and ex exegetical parody in Spain. Uh, in, in Spain, so uh, literary academies have been an important part of intellectual life on the Iberian Peninsula during the 16th century. And they played a major role in developing poetry, drama, and prose. In Amsterdam, this tradition was continued. Poetic societies, poets' guilds were established for the cultivation of Spanish poetry. I will give a few examples of the poetic Iberian heritage. This is one. Uh, the author of this work, Dialogo dos Montes, was Rejuel Yesurun, his, his Spanish name was Paulo da Pina, who composed this play in 1624 when it was performed in, in the synagogue Bet Yaakov, the first Sephardic congregation in Amsterdam, on the occasion of the Shavuot festival. Da Pina was born in Lisbon into a new Christian family and he moved to Amsterdam in 1604. And this play is an example of the genre of religious auto, auto that developed and flourished mainly in Spain. The autos were one act plays with a religious intention and a didactic undertone. And this is the story of the claims of the two mountains uh, Sinai. Uh, just see that I have the wrong picture here. Yeah, this is it. Uh, this is the story of the claims of the two mountains, Sinai and Moria, of being the place where the Torah is to be given. The subject clearly comes from Jewish sources, but the form is entirely Iberian. Many examples of poems can be found in the compilations of uh, David Franco Mendes, who was an important member of the congregation, a Talmudic scholar, and one of the leading poets of the 18th century. Some of his poetry 
is his own creation and some are copies of works by others. And you've already seen this one. This is an example of a Spanish octava by Daniel Levy de Barrios with Hebrew tra translation. And on the right, a Portuguese sonnet also with a Hebrew translation. This is an anonymous uh, rhymed Spanish paraphrase of the uh, Pentateuch. And this is a polemical discourse composed in verse by Abraham Gomez Severa, also uh, written in Amsterdam about 1680. It is a theological debate with, between a Calvinist minister, a Catholic scholar, a learned Turkish Muslim and a Jew, wherein each defends the supremacy of his own religion. That's also something that you might want to know. We have a lot of polemics in the collection of Ezraim. Very, very interesting uh, to read. We also have some examples of calligraphy, which I feel are very much influenced by Iberian motives. Uh, this always makes me think of the uh, Alhambra in Granada. Maybe you know what I mean when you see this uh, slide. On the left is a Spanish translation of Hebrew prayers according to the Sephardic rite copied by the master scribe Yehuda Macabeo in 1650. Uh, then in the middle, you see the polemical work Providencia de Dios. Um, it was originally written by Saul Levi Motera in Portuguese. And when it was complete, it was sent to Moses Rafael Daguila, Chacham of the Sephardic Congregation of Amsterdam, who revised and, it and translated it into Spanish. On the right, the Respuesta by Isaac Orobia de Castro, who was a doctor, a philosopher and writer, and a leading Jewish scholar in Amsterdam. To escape the Inquisition, he fled the Iberian Peninsula in 1660. While he had already enjoyed a career in medicine in Amsterdam, the Castor also became an active polemicist. This elegant manuscript copied in Amsterdam by Abraham Machoro with a drawn frame in the style of Yehuda Maccabeo. Yehuda Maccabeo uh, illustrated the, the manuscript on the left is a response to Juan de Prado, a Spanish Jewish doctor who rejected the authority of rabbinic tradition. Now, we get to the subject of Kabbalah, because Kabbalah definitely was a subject that this congregation was interested in. Uh, Gerona had been a center of Kabbalah in the 13th century, and from there it shifted to Castile. In the beginning of the 14th century, the Kabbalah in Spain underwent a crisis in creativity. No extensive works of Kabbalistic thought were written during the generation preceding the expulsion. However, immediately after the expulsion, in the beginning of the 16th century, many Kabbalistic treaties were written by the Spanish refugees. And in general, we can say that uh, all major works of, of Kabbalah are to be found in uh, the library at Schreim. Um, by the early 18th century, all the Kabbalistic and Lurianic works spread across Europe, and Kabbalah was widely read in Amsterdam, especially because Amsterdam was the center of Jewish printing, and many Kabbalistic works were printed in Amsterdam from 1650 onwards. This is the Ilan Svirot, showing the structure of the divine emanations that you can see here on this slide. This is also a beautiful manuscript. Uh, the book is called Puerta del Cielo, Gate of Heaven, and it is a Kabbalistic work about God and the cosmos. It was written by Abraham Co Cohen de Herrera, who was born in 1575 and went to Amsterdam, we, we think, of, uh, after 1590, and uh, there he converted to Judaism. Herrera had a very strong influence on the spiritual life of the Amsterdam community, and this is also one of the three manuscripts that uh, still exist, very unique manuscript. Uh, another subject, which I find says a lot about the, uh, the congregation and also the Iberian uh, connection or uh, uh, identity is the relation to official. Um, traditionally, the relationships, the relationship with Dutch royalty have always been excellent. Many poems and prayers are dedicated to the stadtholders, princes, and kings of Orange. We have a Hebrew prayer for the success of the campaign of William III in Ireland. There are Hebrew prayers with Portuguese title for a speedy 
delivery for the Princess of Orange in 1769 and for an easy pregnancy of the Princess of Orange in 1772. We have a Hebrew and Portuguese prayer for the marriage of William V of Orange and a Portuguese poem for his installation and many, many more, I have to say. This example that you see here is a poem to celebrate the adulthood of William III in the year 1766 in Dutch and in Hebrew. It's a beautiful poem. Uh, you might ask yourself, yourselves how this poem show us traces of Iberian identity. Well, let me quote René Levin Melamed, who describes the relationship of the Jews in medieval Spain like this. The Jews appreciated being associated with the king and preferred to bypass the local bu bureaucracy. The direct line to the cr crown was not only a matter of status. The community could generally count on the king for protection and appeal to him when need be. These thoughts must have been in the DNA of the Portuguese community. It is in Amsterdam, it is impossible to say whether the concept of bypassing local authority in Amsterdam was of importance. However, we do not have any evidence of prayers or poems in our collection written for a local authority, only for, the, for royalty. So maybe that says a lot. Let me just scratch on another subject that is part of the Sephardic DNA trade and overseas activities. This is an example of a dictionary in Portuguese, Spanish, French, and Dutch of shipping terms. The book was used as a handbook for the insurance broker David Franco Mendes, whom we have already met as a poet. And to come back to the question that I posed in the beginning, what do the manuscripts tell us about the young Sephardic community in Amsterdam and how did they perceive themselves? By looking at the manuscripts and printed works, we have seen that there is a very strong emotional attachment to Spain, to Spanish and Portuguese, to the Iberian Peninsula in general, and even to the way of life. From the 17th century on, the community has always taken pride in the Iberian heritage and remained doing so. Even in our times, the strong identification with Spain and Portugal continues to exist. So let me conclude with Menasseh ben Israel. We have you have heard his name before, the first printer of Hebrew, the first Jewish printer of Hebrew in Amsterdam. When Frederick Hendrik and his son Willem II and the English Queen Henrietta Maria and her daughter Mary, Princess Royal and Bride of William II visited the synagogue, Manasseh wrote his welcoming speech and spoke the famous words, we no longer think of Castile as our fatherland, but Holland. This is a very strong statement when we are talking about identity. And you might even say that this doesn't, statement doesn't help to prove the point that I want to make in this presentation about the evident Sephardic identity that we can see in the collection. The examples that you saw allow us a view into the Sephardic mind and soul. And in terms of identity, one cannot get much closer to the lives and hearts of the 17th and 18th century Portuguese Jew in Amsterdam than we did today. Maybe we can look at it like this. The Iberian Peninsula was their native country. Holland was their homeland and Svarat their heartland. And this emotion is something that clearly is visible in the collection of Ebsrein. Uh, this should have been the last slide in my presentation, uh, but talking about emotion, I decided to sneak in two more slides because they are so beautiful. I hope that you will enjoy them. This is a, a Ketuba, a marriage contract uh, for uh, Abraham de Pinto and Rachel uh, Rovigo. And it is signed by Menasseh ben Israel. It is absolutely beautiful. And I know that on this slide, you can't see that much. So this is uh, my first, uh, uh, first time that I will invite you to Etzreim, to the library, to have a look at the, uh, the marriage contract um, in real. And the other manuscript I would like to show you is this one. Uh, this is the famous Amsterdam Haggadah. Uh, maybe you have heard of it before. It is, uh, it is very beautiful. It is a printed work and it is the very first time that copper engravings were used uh, in a, a Jewish book. Uh, 1695, uh, 
printed in Amsterdam. And the interesting thing is that the copper engravings uh, are taken, were taken uh, from a, uh, from a Protestant, Protestant Bible uh, by Matthäus Merian. And uh, someone, Abraham by Jacob, adapted them for this Haggadah, for this Jewish book. So it has a very Christian feel, but it is absolutely beautiful. And to this day, as far as I know, it is reprinted. It also has a, a map of the Holy Land in, uh, you can see that on the slide as well. Very, very beautiful. What also is interesting, I just told you about the 1666, um, I don't know, can I call it the Shabbat Tzvi disaster? Uh, the fact that Shabbat Tzvi uh, wasn't the Messiah. Um, it, this is printed in 1695 and you will find uh, around the map, you will find some hints to Kabbalah and mess Messianism, which, uh, which is very interesting because the, uh, the board of the congregation just didn't want anything to hear about Messianism anymore after 1666, but it is, it is all in, in there. So if you want to visit the library, that is of course possible. Uh, there are tours uh, given by myself or by, by special uh, tour guides. Um, uh, so that's always possible to book a tour. And also uh, if you want to do research in the library, you are very welcome. We are not a museum. It looks like we are, but we mainly are a research library, so you are very welcome to do your research. I have to say one little thing, um, that we are not an archive. The archives of the Portuguese congregation are housed in the munis municipal archives of Amsterdam. So if you want, really want to do family research, uh, maybe that would be the first po point, the first place you should go to. But uh, you can also, of course, always try to find something in the library itself. We have 600 manuscripts, 25,000 printed books, and I'm absolutely sure that there will be something to your liking. Thank you very much. <laughs>